Hi, how is everyone <laughs> after that? Was everybody taking notes? There will be an exam later on how to do those burr holes uh, for one. Um, thank you for having not one, but two knots to your Founders Day celebrations today. Um, I really hope it's been a wonderful day thus far. It's been a pleasure to join you all for lunch, and I hope you've had a chance to reconnect with friends in a spirit of faith and fellowship after a long imposed um, COVID-imposed break. I will now speak a little further about what inspires David and I to do the work that we do and leave some time for questions, and you'll be relieved to hear there are no slides. The theme of your day today has been healing. David has spoken about his work in conflict zones over the past 30 years, where he has helped to heal physically many hundreds, if not thousands, of patients. I'm not a doctor myself, but created an organization which can teach more to be healers like David and his colleagues. When David and I met, I immediately started to think about how we could bring the training he'd started doing in Libya and Syria to many more people. There is a real need for the work we do, and as chief executive of our foundation, I'm able to see that need firsthand in various places around the world. We are women together today in our fellowship, and I want to mention one woman in particular who I had the privilege to meet in March of this year. Now, over Christmas, I had COVID. And in my search for something to uplift and enliven me, I came across a book on our shelves. A woman of firsts is Edna Aden Ismail's inspiring story of how she became a pioneering political and global health leader and campaigner for women's rights. The respect and affection in which she is held in her home country of Somaliland is truly remarkable and something I witnessed wherever I drove with her in her battered Tatar Jeep around Hargeisa. In 1998, she began building a hospital on an empty patch of land in the capital of Somaliland. Through her will and determination, the foundations Edna established became a maternity hospital and is now a major referral center. It treats obstetric, pediatric, surgical, and medical cases from across the Horn of Africa. And the Edna Aden University provides skilled healthcare workers to work in the hospital and other institutions in Somaliland. When I contacted Edna in January and asked if she would be interested in us running one of our hostile environment surgical training HEST courses at her hospital, she welcomed the idea straight away. From the moment we arrived in Somaliland, we felt the warmth of Edna's hospitality and all the inspirational healthcare workers who had traveled from across the country to participate in our training. Our outstanding faculty enjoyed sharing knowledge and techniques that would make a real difference to the participants' management of traumatic injuries. There's a real need for this training, I can't say enough. A, a Lancet Global Surgery Survey reported in 2015 that some 5 billion people around the world lack access to safe, skilled surgical care that isn't completely ruinously expensive for them and their families. It's a hard thing to imagine, having to make a choice between feeding your family and provided, providing desperately needed surgical care. The HES course we ran in March is just the start of our collaboration with Somaliland, and in the coming months, we want to welcome some of the doctors we trained to the UK to be trained on the Trainer Trainers course, which they can then return to Somaliland and be part of our faculty next time we return there. By chance, our course coincided with International Women's Day. A solid third of the participants in the HES course were women, something that isn't always the case when we travel around the world. And we were delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to their surgical careers. Whilst there are many highly impressive humanitarian organizations deploying medical teams to areas in need around the world, I could not find any other organization that focuses solely on teaching and training and empowering local healthcare workers, as we seek to do in Somaliland and around the world. Change can only be sustainable if it is adopted and continued, essentially internalized, by local communities. 
It's the old adage, give a man a fish and he will feed himself for a day. Teach a man or woman to fish and they will feed themselves and their families for a lifetime. A challenge of this scale cannot be addressed by well-meaning healthcare workers from the UK and Europe traveling abroad on medical missions. That capacity has to be built in a local, at a local level in a way that helps communities on a generational level and respects their dignity. Helping people to do for themselves rather than having things done to or for them. And so how do we do that? As David has described, and I've mentioned in Somaliland, we run these surgical training courses around the world. Our principal area of focus being the Middle East and Africa, and more recently, Ukraine. What was once a two-day lecture-based PowerPoint presentation course is now a five-day highly interactive um, kind of session whereby um, our students are able to explore every single part of the body and every sur surgical specialism thanks to the wonders of, of Heston, our model made from silicon and rubber. We've taught in Turkey, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, Cameroon, Bangladesh, Kenya, Libya, Argentina, Chile, Somaliland, Palestine, and Iraq. And motivating us at all times is a belief that whether you're in Shrewsbury or Somaliland, access to safe, skilled surgical care is a universal and inalienable right. Our mission is to provide the best in surgical care surgical training for the benefit of those who need that care the most. For David and I, it is an all-encompassing mission. After supper, our evenings are often spent tapping away on our laptops, making calls and working out how best we can deliver that mission. Working with one's husband might not be everyone's idea of a good time, but it works for us. The foundation is strong because it is driven by two people for whom this is not just work, but a calling. Reading more about your wonderful organization, I noted your statement that whatever we do, we uphold and share the Christian ideals of fellowship and family life. There is a very real family, that of David and I and our daughters, at the heart of the foundation. And there is a wider fellowship of healthcare workers we have nurtured around the world like a family. No country is more special to us than Syria. And the Syrian revolution has been a constant thread running through my personal and professional life ever since I met my husband some eight years ago and was in fact the thing that brought us together. It was the summer of 2014 that our past first crossed at an event convened to discuss the humanitarian response to what was going on in Syria at that time. As our conversation ended, David asked my boss and some colleagues to stay behind to see some photos and videos of his surgical mission to Eastern Aleppo the previous year. As we know, this is something David likes to do. My boss and colleagues made hasty excuses and left me with not much stomach for the grizzly or the gory left behind. I sat next to David, told myself to stop being such a coward, and watched, stunned, as David showed me photo after photo of the doctors, the hospitals, and the patients of what was then free Aleppo. There was one video in particular that stayed with me, that of a baby being delivered by emergency C-section following a sniper attack on her mother that made me physically cry out. A video you have seen too, and I wonder if it had the same impact on you as it did to me. That is the impact of surgery. Two minutes of swift intervention <coughs> that can save mother and baby. I was stunned. A little over a year later, David and I would be in a very different hospital, this time in West London, welcoming our own baby to the world. I'm not sure I would have believed anyone if they'd told me that summer afternoon that that's what would have been happening a year later. Since 2016, we have trained 264 Syrian doctors alone, over five HEST courses, and several specialist obstetric and neonatal care courses held in Gaziantep and Idlib. 
Our courses are sometimes held in partnership with other Syrian medical organizations. And we also advocate for the medical victims of conflict, both those civilians forced into hospital as a result of conflict, and the healthcare workers who so often find themselves illegally under international law as victims. The facts in a wide variety of conflict settings over the past 30 years leave little space for any conclusion other than that healthcare workers have been and continue to be targeted. They are targeted in different ways and consistent themes emerge in multiple conflict settings including Myanmar, Ethiopia, Ukraine and of course Syria. We see the manipulation of the resources of the international humanitarian system including restricting access to areas in need, a culture of apparent impunity, where are the indictments of people who, who, uh, who launch or who order attacks on healthcare facilities? Healthcare services are often forced on the ground, as we saw in Syria and in Ukraine also. And healthcare workers have been targeted through legislation, military bombardments, harassment, detention and torture, and also hostile propaganda, seen so painfully in the example of James Lemessure, one of the very impressive founders of the White Helmet Civil Defense Units in Syria, who was hounded to his death by harassment and social media violence. We will continue to speak up for our colleagues around the world. Now, as the COVID pandemic has eased, we have welcomed the opportunity to get responsibly back to training abroad. Since November, we've trained 84 healthcare professionals over three HEST courses in Iraq, Somaliland and Turkey. We held the courses with established and new operational partners. And in December, with COVID restrictions still limiting the ability of doctors to travel to the UK to be trained by us on our surgical training for steel environments course, we, offered, we opened up our 14 places to recently arrived refugees in the UK from Syria and Afghanistan. And two of the doctors in the short news night film that we saw actually ended up on that course in December. And one of our Afghan scholars was one of those who left Kabul airport last August amidst those horrendous scenes we all saw as the Taliban swept back into power. She left with the clothes on her back and is now here in the UK striving to reinvigorate her medical career. She supports nine family members and does so with determination, humility and grace. In a further demonstration of our responsiveness to the needs of our colleagues worldwide, David ran a 12-hour intensive training session for Ukrainian doctors in just nine days after the invasion of that country. The world is in deep need of healing. You've identified that. The horror perpetrated by the Russian regime against Ukraine burns nightly on our television screens, but Syria is suffering still, as is Iraq and Afghanistan and Palestine. It can sometimes feel hopeless, but I often recall the words of 1 Corinthians 13, that now faith, hope, and love remain, these three things, and the greatest of these is love. Love for our families, communities, not just those beside us today, but the community of nations. We can all do our part and contribute to healing our fractured world if we stay true to our faith, our hope, and our love. Thank you for your time. Right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, does anybody have any questions yes. for Ellie? I heard someone squeak. Yes, Mary Rose. Who made Heston? Who made Heston? So Heston um, was made, uh, David's was the kind of um, inspiration for it, and every single cut, every single incision was at David's direction. And he was made by a, a, another wonderful husband and wife team at a studio in West London. It's literally the two of them, and he's made with a variety of, of rubber, soft silicones, and some magnets to attach his legs. So yes. <laughs> 
How many of them are, are there worldwide? There's, there's one Heston. There's one. only one Heston. Yes. And we're looking to, um, to create another quite quickly because every time we take him abroad, it's absolutely terrifying. Because as you can imagine, he, uh, he raises quite a few questions when he goes through customs. And um, one, one Turkish border guard even got a selfie with Heston. So he's, he's quite the celebrity. And um, we need to make sure we have another one in case the worst happens and he, he disappears somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Do you, would you like this? I should de declare an interest. In a previous life, I was a reconstructive plastic surgery nurse. Yeah. You've talked about training the surgeons. Do you train the nurses as well? Because that does make a difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. Um, Somaliland, where we were in early March, was the first course when we have had a, a nursing module, a nursing component. It was just one session, um, just a kind of an afternoon, but it was, it was amazing actually because we, we took a nurse and he just started, it, we wanted, he wanted to kind of find out what they were doing and then kind of advise in terms of WHO um, uh, safety kind of guidelines and, and we actually helped change that for the hospital and implement kind of um, cleanliness and sterility kind of protocols. So we, we trialed it in Somaliland and the idea is to, to do it again in other courses. Likewise with anesthesia as well, we had a, a day-long course at the end of the HEST in Somaliland and the idea is to run more um, anesthetics courses too. So rather than looking at just the surgeon, we're looking at a kind of whole of the operating theatre approach, so including nurses and as as well. Thank yeah. you, Ellie. Oh yes, I'll, I'll come to you. How on earth do you raise the money for all the airfares? How do you do it? You haven't mentioned that. No, we've been incredibly fortunate, and I, we've been so, so lucky. Um, David uh, did uh, Desert Island Discs in 2016, and it was, it was a very popular episode, and some of you may have, may have heard it. And um, basically, at that time, I was, I was the only member of staff of the foundation. I remember sitting with our, our one-year-old Molly in our arms in our kitchen listening to it. And every time we received a donation, I got an email and my phone was just blowing up with the number of um, donations that were incoming. So we've been incredibly fortunate, very kind, generous members of the public and some foundations too that have connected with what we're doing and connected with David's work um, and what he's done around the world. And um, we, we've been very, very fortunate. And um, yeah, we, we have the ability to, to take on courses and yeah, with, with, with certainty for the future, which is really wonderful. Thank you, Ellie. Ah, I can see your hand. I should also mention David's book, War Doctor, as well, which um, was another very helpful way of, of getting our, our mission out there. I think it's fair to say that we're all in awe of the work that you and David do, but you're also a mum and dad. How do you balance this huge calling mm -hmm. to do the work that you do with family life? Absolutely. Family always comes first and always, always will. I spent the last two afternoons consecutively in various doctors and um, hospitals with my daughter Molly, who first of all sprained her wrist in PE and then we, there was a tick incident as well. And it's just, I think family is at the heart. It's, it's as a mother, it's my strength. I have found a calling in life being a mother that's just made me kind of have the ability and the to do the work I do because I want to make my daughters proud of me. And we never travel at the same time. We're never ab abroad together. One of us, if one of us is traveling, the other one is always home with the girls. So we just, yeah, they're always at the center of everything and always will be. And um, yeah, we, we're never away from them at the same time. Um, and yeah, 
being, I think they inspire me to do the work I do. It's particularly kind of maternal care and um, neonatal resuscitation as well is a very important area for me because when our youngest daughter Elizabeth was born, she was on the um, NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit for a week. And I just thought, my God, I'm in, I'm in central London at this wonderful hospital. She's in the best possible care. But if I'm in, you know, part of rural Somaliland or in, you know, bomb destroyed Aleppo, I would not have that kind of same care. So we just feel very lucky and want to, to bring that same standard of care to many other families around the world. Thank you, Ellie. Um, any more questions? Um, oh, right over there, right. Dream, was it you? Thank you. Uh, could you just remind me what ICRC stands for? And also, were you able to operate a triage system with the injuries? So um, ICRC is International Committee of the Red Crescent or International Committee of the Red Cross. So those are the two, two parts of ICRC. And um, yes, there is a, a module in the HEST course on triage, triaging patients when they come to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any more? For any more? Uh, no? No? In which case, Ellis... I thank you personally very much indeed, but you're going to get your official thanks from, from our central chairman, Emily. Follow that. I think we're all a bit stunned. Ellie, I can't thank you enough. I'm quite emotional, and I think some of you know that I get emotional anyhow, but this is completely off piece, but I can't say enough about what you do and what David achieves uh, between the two of you. Uh, you may have already know that uh, St. Christopher's Hospice is near to our hearts uh, as an organization. And of course, um, Frances here is our representative. Um, she and I went up to meet the team at St. Christopher's a couple of weeks ago, and they are doing very similar things to you in terms of bringing people over from other countries to learn about the hospice movement. And they're going back and taking back those ideas and those techniques to other countries. So I think we all felt much greater interest in your healing note and your love for other people. So thank you very much. Um, the early days of our roots, when our founders were coping with such challenges, as austerity and political unrest after the First World War, there were endless discussions over what this organization should be called, what the constitution should look like, and what age should women join. That was in 1916. Nothing much has changed, <laughs> except we've all got older, and we don't represent a younger contingent of women like our daughters. But in 2022, we still have 64 branches around the country and over 2,000 members, and we enjoy similar programs and ideas going forward. Founders Meeting is a way of linking us to our roots, reminding us that as women, we have much to offer our local communities, our friends, and our families just as our forebears did. To quote a little from that very first constitution, that WF may take counsel together and by study and prayer in fellowship, try to uphold the standard of Christ 
in the many-sided many life to which they are called to play their part today. I can think of nothing better than finding myself at another founders meeting among friends with those links to the past. Hearing Davy and Ellie Knott about the work they do really brings it home that we need to constantly listen, learn and try to understand the needs of the war zones around the globe, just as our forebears did after the First and Second World Wars. I want to thank Shrewsbury for a wonderful, wonderful, stimulating and uplifting day. Mary Rose, Chairman, Sally Davis, Secretary, wherever Sally is, um, and the committee, Sarah O'Boyle, Fiona Bouffler, Anne Flint, Anne Sharp, Diana Bart, and Caroline Thules, and all those branch members who've helped in the preparation for today and helped in any possible way. You know what it's like, each one of you, to arrange flowers, to organize that service, which was superb. We were thoroughly lifted, it was beautifully done. Everything was thought of today. Thank you all so much. I especially want to thank Anne Constable for her unstinting way of guiding us all through this technical age and for her work as National Events Secretary. Anne stands down after today and Pamela Salt uh, takes over. And Anne has been the most amazing National uh, Events Secretary, so thank you, Anne, wherever you are. You've all been aware of our photographers, Annabelle and Caroline, who are helping record today. Thank you both very much. Um, I'm sorry if anyone's felt a little um, overcome by these, uh, these things going on in the background. Um, and again, the service this morning was equally beautiful. Our thanks go to everybody. Um, it was wonderful. I want, to say, I want to say thank you particularly to Reverend Sam Mann and the Venerable Paul Thomas. I know, are they both here? Is Sam here as well? Has he gone? Yeah. Um, that was wonderful. Your sermon today was such a wonderful grounding for all of us. Um, thank you very much indeed. And I think we learned a lot about love. Thank you. And although I've mentioned it, I, I, a very special thank you to Ellie for giving us a greater understanding of the work that the Knots do. We send our love and, and thank you to David for spending time recording his talk before he heads back to, back to the fray. It's been a wonderful day. Thank you to Netley Hall, wherever they are, um, and all your team um, for an excellent lunch and the care you've given us all the day. Now, I know Anne wants a word, wherever she is. Uh, this isn't really me skipping out the door as fast as I possibly can as I'm <laughs> finishing my final event. Um, but I have got a message for you from Pamela. Um, as you heard, she is taking over from me. Uh, she does send her apologies, but also her best wishes of, for today. Uh, she starts from the 1st of June. And she's asked me to say that she would love to hear from any branch or group of branches that are interested in hosting events in the future. Um, sadly, we have no date or branch or location for founders meeting next year, yet. <laughs> uh, Pamela's got lots of ideas, so watch this space, but if anybody here in the room thinks that, oh, well that was a pretty good day, I think we could do that, or maybe, what about we join with another branch or two? So we're very flexible, I think now, it'd be fair to say, and always have been in women in fellowship. But please, if anybody has got any desire or would like to find out a little bit more about what's involved, 
um, then Pamela is going to be the person to contact. But talking of things that are happening, um, I would like to ask Claire Stewart to come forward and say a few words about Autumn Conference. Before Claire says anything, I've got one practical reminder here that I've got a big note on here that says train, trains. Um, if anybody is going back or is catching the train from Shrewsbury Station and hasn't already organized their lift back there, uh, would they please see Sally Davis? Um, Sally's waving at the back there. I know quite a few people are organized, but if there is anybody who hasn't yet done so, would you please see Sally? Otherwise, your chances of getting to catch your train might be a bit challenging. Right, so that's enough for me, and I'm now going to hand over to Claire, who's going to tell you about Autumn Conference. Autumn Conference is going to be held on Wednesday, the 28th of September, at Gloucester Cathedral. Um, we're having our talk and service in the Lady Chapel, and refreshments and lunch will be in the chapter house. Our speaker is going to be Dr. Janina Ramirez. She is the president of the Gloucester History Society. She's a professor at Oxford and a visiting professor elsewhere, and she is a medievalist, but she can speak on any aspect of art. And at the moment, um, one of her series is being broadcast on BBC, right, um, Channel 4. And it was at the, held at the weekend, shown at the weekend, and um, she was in Barcelona. She was also interviewed at the weekend as well on Radio 4. So we hope, you know, we can see you there. One thing, parking is nearby. There is very little parking at the cathedral. That's just a warning, but the station is in the centre of town and there is a good park and ride. And we hope to see many of you there. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, before we let Ellie go, I know she's got, got wants to go to train, um, would we like to bring Sarah up, please? Ellie, this has come from us for you to say a very, very big thank you from all of us. Thank you. Well, I think let's finish off with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.